Hello, this is Ben Thompson with the Free Citizens of America. Now, we are going to be refocusing our efforts because basically we have come to understand that exposing the secret combination directly is not the way to go about stopping it. <coughs> and of course that information has come from the Bible. And the, the true way to preserve the United States of America is to teach the Torah, which is the law of God specifically described within the first five books of the Bible. <clears throat> now, the truth is, the, the United States Constitution was designed for a people who lived and believed in the Torah. No other nation has been so affected by the Torah than the United States. In fact, in Hebrew, the Hebrew designation for the United States of America is Artsoth Habrit, which means the lands of the covenant, referring specifically to the Constitution. And we know that the, the Constitution is based off of principles found in the Torah. It is, it is my hope today to show you that the Torah and the Constitution are inseparable. And the reason why our Constitution is being destroyed is because the people have no understanding of the Torah. <coughs> because we no longer hold value with the Torah. And for this reason is our Constitution being destroyed and our freedoms are being eroded away by a secret combination. And if we will return to the Torah, then we will be able to regain our lost freedoms and we will be able to overpower the secret combination that has taken place in the land. <coughs> now I have here an excellent document, it's called the Torah and the Constitution by man named Norman Berdigevsky and I'm going to be reading from parts of that to help show that the, the Torah is in fact inseparable from the Constitution and the Constitution is inseparable from the, the Torah says here, the American Revolution, which established the system of federal and state government in the United States, promulgated a respect for equality of individual citizens before the law, a cardinal point that rejects monarchy, and above all places ultimate reliance on a fixed document, the Constitution, rather than a monarchy held in great reverence. In this regard, the United States, a republic from its inception, developed a written code which was the final arbiter of all problems and conflicts. It is the means to decide what is legal and what is illegal. The designation in modern Hebrew for the United States is Artsoth Habrit. That literally means the lands of the covenant. For Hebrew speakers, this name struck an immediate responsive chord that America was a country that placed the rule of law foremost above all persons and privileges. Brit means covenant, and was also the term used for circumcision, the act that made the covenant a visible sign in the flesh before God and the descendants of Abraham and Isaac. This covenant, the Torah, constituted the voluntary acceptance of a righteous moral code. The Torah and the Constitution were elevated by Jews and Americans respectively as the final recourse and supreme arbiter of political disputes and moral conflicts, 
The law, rather than any president or king, was acknowledged as the source of power in the state. A King Ahab or a President Nixon were displaced not by armed insurrection or devious political maneuvering, but by the sense of public outrage that they had abused the moral authority that had been entrusted to them. <coughs> the prophets had the Torah, and the political opponents of the administration had the Constitution on their side. A King Solomon and a President Clinton, even if not impeached or deposed, suffered the scorn and humiliation of having betrayed their sacred trust. Nowhere else but in ancient Israel and modern America is there a document that is so respected and carries such weight. In Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter seven, verses sixteen through twenty, God clarifies the nature of the covenant He has made, not only with Israel but with granting Solomon the office of king. <coughs> For now I have chose and sanctified this house, that my name be there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. As for thee, if thou wilt walk as David, thy father walked, and do according to all that I have covenanted with David, thy f and and do according to all that I have commanded thee, I shall observe my statutes and judgments. Then will I establish the throne of thy kingdom, as I have covenanted with David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land which I have given them, and I will cast them out of my sight. Fulfilling a similar covenant, the oath of office requires the President to swear on the Bible to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. Notice that President Obama has never successfully sworn oath upon the Bible and that the first time he had to do it several times, each time doing it wrong and then this time they did it in clo behind closed doors and the reason for that is because they have no intention of fulfilling the oath of the Constitution. <clears throat> Monarchy traditionally relied on faith and belief in the divine right to rule. In this respect, it was ordained as part of the Christian emphasis on just those qualities. Most Christian theologians have stressed the significance of faith. It, rather than good works, is for them the key to salvation. On the other hand, traditional Judaism has always regulated belief to a very unimportant consideration, but insisted that the key to following God's will and being religious was to obey his ordinances, i.e. committing acts and deeds rather than having a distinct faith or doctrine of belief. For Orthodox Jews, these have been elaborated into a compendium of 613 precepts to be followed to the letter. Less observant Jews, or those who consider themselves more in tune with modern society, still have a strong partiality to acting out their commitment to religious principles by performing worthy acts following God's written word rather than believing in a specific dogma. The insistence on the written law parallels American regard for the Constitution as a document by which the highest judicial authority the Supreme Court was given the right to interpret it in order to decide what is the law of the land and what is forbidden to be rejected, no matter how many legislators voiced their approval. Until the destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70 AD, the great Sanhedrin, a type of Jewish Supreme Court, met in an assembly of 71 members. They had both judicial and legislative functions and claimed powers to try the king, extend the boundaries of the temple in Jerusalem, and settle all questions of law. In some cases, it was only necessary for a 23-member panel, functioning as a lesser Sanhedrin, to convene. In general, the full panel of 71 judges was only convened on matters of national significance, such as declaration of war, or in the event that the 23-member panel could not reach a conclusive verdict. From the earliest days of the New England Pur Puritan colonies, the following elements made the acceptance of Jews for a high political office more likely than other new immigrants, a great respect for the Ten Commandments in the Hebrew language, an, empath an emphasis on education and literacy, a commitment to abide by mutual agreed upon written covenants. Furthermore, there was an esteem for the Old Testament reflected in the prevalence of biblical place names such as Salem and Bethlehem and personal names. Colonial America, especially New England, was populated by countless Isaacs, Josephs, Jacobs, Joshuas, Solomons, and Abrahams. 
one American commander at Bunker Hill and in charge of the Continental Army in New York was Israel Putnam, as well as Sarah's, Ruth's, Rebecca's, Rachel's, Deborah's, and Abigail's. Reverence for the Old Testament extended down to copying the measure for a barrel of beer in Massachusetts as specified in Deuteronomy. All this evident regard for the biblical Hebrew heritage made New England initially hospitable to early Jewish settlement. Nothing better illustrates this immense respect for the Old Testament than the words uttered in May 1775 by Ethan Allen, leader of the Green Mountain Boys in Vermont, when challenged by British soldiers at the gates of Fort Ticonderoga, on whose authority he was acting to demand its surrender, he replied, by the authority of the great Jehovah and the Continental Congress. The Puritan respect for Hebrew extended to it being a required subject on par with Latin and Greek, and it was part of the curriculum in Harvard, Brown, Princeton, Johns Hopkins, Yale, Columbia, and Dartmouth, the last three of which universities preserve Hebrew inscriptions in their official seals. A Hebrew oration was given annually at Harvard graduation ceremonies until 1817. An intimate knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures and English translation was part of the formative home education of many New Englanders and early settlers in other regions. After all, as the influential Anglo-Jewish historian Cecil Roth puts it, generation after generation of Englishmen heard the Bible read in churches and studied it at home. In many cases, it was the only book, and all the principal book. At last, its cadences, its music, its phraseology sank into his mind and became part of his being. Hence, by slow degrees, his daily speech was not merely enriched, but to some extent molded by its influence. Hundreds of biblical expressions and Hebrew words became a part of the English language and American culture, as if they had originated in it and were subsequently borrowed for successful novels, films, political slogans, popular mottos, embracing folk wisdom, allegories, proverbs, and even stamped on the Liberty Bell, proclaimed liberty throughout the land and all the inhabitants thereof, from Leviticus 25.10, the good earth, little foxes, east of Eden, chariots of fire, let my people go, pastures of plenty, grapes of wrath, each man under his vine and fig tree, by the sweat of your brow, etc., in words directly transcribed to English, Amen, Hallelujah, Hosanna, Manna, Cherubim, Seraphim, Satan, Shibloeth, Cabal, Mammon, Paschal, Messiah, Abbot, Sabbath, Alphabet, Leviathan, and so on. This common vocabulary, moral code, religiously inspired heritage in the form of constitutional government prescribed in the Torah with divinely sanctioned rights that no monarch can violate is what is meant by the adjective Judeo-Christian to characterize our way of life. <clears throat> that is good enough for now. I would suggest you go find that article called The Torah and the Constitution by Norman Bredichkovsky and read it if you want to get even more from it. Now as I said before, I'm now dedicating my time to fight the secret combination by teaching the Torah to counteract the false ideas put forth by the secret combination. I am a descendant of Israel I am a descendant of Israel through the son of Joseph, who is Ephraim. And as such, it is the duty of, of, of my tribe to help to restore the Torah to this region. And I ask all Americans to pick up the Torah and to study it and to learn from its wisdom, and you will be able to see the lies told by the secret combination. If we do not begin to follow the Torah again as we did in the beginning of our nation, then a great judgment will come upon us and it will be World War III. And I will in the next, in the coming weeks, I intend to show you fully that it is entirely possible to create 
a society based off the Torah and the Constitution together. And I will fight the lies that are going out to distort the true meaning of the Torah. I call upon all Christians, Jews, and Muslims to return to the Torah because this is the beginning of the book that we are all based off of. I leave you with, you with this in the name of the Almighty Creator. Amen.